right, good morning and welcome to our first Sunrise Seminar of 2021. Today's topic of discussion will be on coronary CTAs at the Heart Center. My name is Hannah and I will be moderating the CME today. Today's Dr. Friedrichs and Bailey will be joining us as our main speakers. If you have any questions, please make sure to type them in the Q&A section below. We will have our speakers answer them at the end of the presentation. All participants will be muted during the webinar. And at the conclusion of our webinar, all participants will be prompted to respond to a survey over the objectives of our lesson. Please make sure that you answer these survey questions as they will allow you to receive your CME certificate. Um, I am going to go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Friedrich, who's gonna tell us all about CTAs. Good morning. Let me see if I can get my... Is that working? Perfect. Can you hear me? Looks good on my, looks good on my end. Good, okay. So t welcome. Two years ago, Grant gave an overview of coronary CTA. I'm gonna review a few basics, discuss coronary CTA as a first line test, touch on FFRCT, and try to integrate the South Denver experience. Grant is then going to discuss four dimensional CT and appropriateness criteria. Coronary CTA is an amazing technology. I was raised as an interventionalist, but once I saw coronary CTA, I was hooked. This is actually a typical coronary CTA image. Early on, an image this clear would be a textbook example with the reality with the reality that day-to-day -day imaging was rarely this clear. Now, excellent quality images are the norm rather than the exception. In this image, we see the LAD with both calcified and non-calcified plaque. Our reports will often say soft plaque rather than non-calcified plaque, but they're referring to the same thing. In this single view, this appears to be a moderate lesion in the 50 to 70% range. This would be a typical scan that would be referred for FFRCT. And on this side is the correspondent invasive coronary angiographic image. There are many factors that are required to obtain good CT images, but by far the two most important that affect image quality are heart rate control and calcification. Motion is the enemy that must be overcome. While the number of detectors have increased from 64 to 256 with whole heart coverage in a single beat, the rotation speed of the gantry remains the same and cardiac motion will still cause blurring of the images. As you all know, we typically image in diastole when cardiac motion is minimized. The duration of systole is relatively constant as heart rate increases and decreases. As heart rate slows, the duration of diastole increases dramatically. As heart rate increases, diastolic times decrease dramatically. As you know, this is similar to mitral stenosis wherein it's important to control heart rate in order to increase diastolic filling time. For us, the long diastole allows the heart to have a sustained period of decreased motion for imaging. This is why we are so aggressive with metoprolol, ivabradine, and diltiazem. When I attended the virtual SCCT meeting last July, multiple experts said the exact same thing. No matter what the sales reps tell you, and no matter how many millions of dollars you paid for your new scanner, you still need to slow the heart rate if you want decent images. And this is an old slide which looks at coronary calcium and image interpretability. While our current scanner has improved imaging, once scores get to be up greater than 1,000, the regions of uncertainty dramatically increase. Occasionally, you get patients with high calcium scores with superficial calcification and can be very confident in the results. On the other hand, sometimes you have patients with relatively low scores with a big chunk of calcium which causes artifact and makes interpretation less definitive. So at South Denver, we prefer scores less than 1,000. We will scan up to 2,000, but when reading these scores, you gotta realize sensitivity and specificity are significantly reduced. In addition to better images, this slide shows the radiation exposure at South Denver and compares our old scanner with our new scanner. Old scanner values were average 10.7 millisieverts, new scanner, two millisieverts. These are the actual numbers, not the theoretical values advertised by the scanner company. While there are many radiation reduction techniques that have evolved since our first 64 slice scanner, the main difference is we are now scanning with prospective imaging rather than 
retrospective. So with our old scanner, we use full dose radiation throughout the entire cardiac cycle. With prospective gating, the full kilovolts is only used for approximately 30% of the cycle. The other 70% of the cycle is a very low kilovolt, enough to calculate ejection fraction, but less optimal for coronary imaging. So which 30% do we use? Our scanner calculates motion and has an algorithm to image when motion is at a minimum. This is usually during diastole, during this interval. When heart rates are faster, the scanner may decide the optimal imaging is in the end systolic window. Unfortunately, when I see the scanner felt optimal imaging was during systole, it's gonna be a tough read. There will probably be motion artifact involved in the, the right coronary artery and the distal LID. In that case, we'll often look in the low kilovolt images just to see if we can cancel the motion, but this is less optimal for interpretation. And just for comparison, I've added this slide to look at radiation doses for other cardiac procedures. Our old scanner came in around 10 millisieverts. The new scanner is around two. An AP text X-ray doesn't even show here, it's around 0.2. Diagnostic catheterization is around three millisieverts. Annual background radiation at sea level, not in Denver, is around three. A stress nuclear is around 10 to 12. And the annual total body limit for someone who's working in the cath lab is 20 millisieverts. Brenda has provided me with the last 10 years of volumes at South Denver Cardiology for calcium scores and CTA volumes. As you can see, coronary artery calcium scores have increased progressively with volume of our practice over the last 10 years. CTA, coronary CTA volume, on the other hand, has stagnated in the 100 range for the last 10 years until we got our new scanner in 2019, and now it has taken off. This reflects greater awareness of coronary CTA, excitement over our new scanner, lower radiation, but most importantly, broader indications for coronary CTA and acceptance by the payers. Of all these factors, acceptance of coronary CTA as a first line test has been the biggest driver. Here are press releases from SCCT and ACC websites. In May of 2020, United Healthcare approved coronary CTA as a first line test for patients with stable chest pain. This was embraced by New West over a year ago and we were part of their pilot study to see if this was effective. Doug Martell and Tatiana told us that the New West South Denver data was integral in United Healthcare actually making this approval. Then in September of 2020, the ACC summit recommended coronary CT as a first line test. In this summit, summit they referred to the British and United Healthcare data showing lower costs. And just last month, Cigna stated they no longer required pre-authorization for coronary CTA with no mention of appropriateness criteria, and they even um, included imaging of bypass graphs. So why the big change to a CTA first strategy? First, the Scott Hart trial showed that coronary CTA did not increase invasive interventions over five years of follow-up. Data from United Healthcare showed that the CTA first strategy, rather than stress imaging, reduced costs for patients with stable chest pain. Guidelines from the United Kingdom and the European Society of Cardiology recommended CTA as the preferred initial test in patients with lower ranges of clinical likelihood of coronary artery disease. Both Scott Hart and Promise showed that patients' knowledge of the presence of plaque can help prevent or delay onset of cardiac events. That's that if the patients know they have plaque, they take preventive measures. And lastly, the ischemia trial showed that conservative medical therapy did not increase the chance of death myocardial infarction or other adverse outcomes. And in this trial, CTA was used to rule out left main disease. We participate in the PROMISE trial, which did not show a significant difference in outcomes between CTA first strategy and stress testing. The stress testing, if you remember, being either a standard stress test, a stress echo, or a stress nucleo. But these were very low patients, which is the main reason it is believed that a difference was not shown. This is the re recently published five-year data from Scott Hart. This was in the New England Journal, which has driven most of the changes, especially in Europe. In this trial, patients with stable chest pain were randomized to standard care or coronary CTA. And the primary outcome of death, non-fatal MI, on a scale of one to 100 is down here, 
um, a small difference, but they blew up the bottom 5% here. So you actually can see the difference. And what we see is that the CTA group had a significantly lower incidence of death and non-fatal MI, this being 2.3% and this being 3.9%. Patients assigned to coronary CTA were more likely to have started preventive therapies. This is the main explanation for the separation. In the initial report after two years, there was a trend toward higher early coronary vascularization in the group assigned to CTA. This was also seen in the PROMISE trial. At five years, however, there was no difference. And beyond the first 12 months, patients to CTA had lower rates of cath and lower rates of revascularization. Coronary CTA resulted in more correct diagnosis of coronary disease leading to more appropriate therapies. CTA resulted in higher rates of detection of coronary disease than standard care, leading to more early revascularizations and better prevention. And regardless of whether the patients were revascularized or not, the CTA group had less angina. This re represents patients with coronary disease who received greater preventive therapy, but also reassurance to the half of patients with normal coronaries that they didn't have coronary disease, and that results in greater resolution of symptoms, just giving them confidence to know that their symptoms aren't ischemic. Which leads to the new role of coronary CT and chronic coronary disease. Grant's going to review appropriateness criteria, but what we see here is that coronary CTA now is considered a first-line test for patients with any type of chest pain, whether it's typical or atypical, and it's a first-line test for coronary anomalies, and it's reasonable for evaluating patients with known coronary disease reasonable for patients with non-conclusive stress testing, and even reasonable for patients with larger coronary stents. And this is a slide from Heartful looking at different modalities to evaluate chest pain compared to with the gold standard up here, which is invasive FFR, with sensitivity on the x-axis and specificity on the y-axis stress echo up here in blue, a couple of studies of catheterization in purple without FFR, spec down here in red, and then the, in green are the coronary CTA studies. And what this emphasizes is that coronary CTA is very sensitive, but not very specific. Lots of false positives. But I put this slide in to emphasize that CTA can provide additional information beyond non-invasive imaging and even heart catheterization. Coronary calcium scoring is likely the most important benefit, as we saw from the Scott Hart data. Identifying coronary disease leads to prevention, which leads to decreased future events. But coronary CTA also can look at plaque morphology, which is a growing field. On the left, you can see non-calcified plaque in the vessels larger here, that's positive remodeling. And um, with despite this, the lumen here on the left, is similar to the lumen here on the right, which is a patient with a chronic calcified lesion. The patient on the left over here, are, however, with the high-risk features of soft plaque, will have an event rate five to 10 times the patient on the right. But let's get back to the problem of coronary CTA, and that is specificity. This is also from heart flow. What heart flow does is it takes a CT angiogram. It looks at the anatomy to determine how big the vessels are, the volume of myocardium in the vessels serve, and how severe the stenosis are. They put into a hydraulic um, physiology model that goes into a black box with their um, patented calculator, and it determines an FF, it produces these beautiful diagrams with an FFR ratio, a hyperemic flow ratio. If it produces a value that is greater than 0.8, the lesions are not flow limiting. This is similar to the invasive FFR numbers. If it produces a value less than 0.8, it is believed to be hemodynamically significant. And the heart flow literature states that this provides 90% sensitivity, 86% specificity, and diagnostic accuracy of 87%. But here's a, a real world study from Japan in 2019, which compared FFRCT with invasive FFR. FFRCT on this axis, FFR here, and these are the values um, obtained with 0.8 being these lines through here. And this divides into four quadrants, true positives down here, true negatives up here. 
the problem is the false positives down here and the false negatives up here. 18% of the stenosis that FFRCT deemed to be hemodynamically significant, to, excuse me, 18% of the stenosis of FFRCT said that are not significant, that are greater than 0.8, actually had values less than 0.8 by invasive CT. These are the false negatives. Conversely, 30% of the stenosis at FFRCT deemed to be hemodynamically significant below 0.8 um, turned out to have invasive FFR values greater than 0.8, and these are the false positives. And in this study, the diagnostic accuracy in the range between 0.7 and 0.8, where all these dots down here are grouped, was about 50-50. They came up with 0.46. And so when you get these borderline values between 0.7 and 0.8, you've got to realize that this is, um, this is them flipping the coin rather than us trying to determine if a lesion is significant. So in summary, coronary CTA works well with slow heart rates and low calcium scores. A CTA first strategy is increasingly being embraced by guideline writers and payers. FFR CT helps with the specificity of coronary CTA, but can still be ambiguous, particularly in values in the 0 0.7, 0 0.8 range. And reimbursement for coronary CTA and FFR CT are the major obstacles to wider use. So that's what I have to say. Um, Grant's going to take it from here. All right, thanks, Steve. That's a tough act to follow. That was fantastic and really a good segue into uh, my review of the appropriate use criteria. So let me just get my screen share going. And, uh, all right, so I'm going to review the, uh, as a great segue to what Steve was saying, I'm going to review the appropriate use criteria and also help people decide a little bit as to, you know, one of the most common questions I get is, is this patient appropriate for CTA? Um, because as Steve said, with, with CTA, it has very, very good sensitivity and negative predictive value and can be an excellent um, CT first uh, strategy if if you're selecting the right patients, and that's the most important thing. So we'll talk a little bit about how the exams are uh, acquired and a little bit about what patients are ideal for CTA and which patients are less than ideal and help people select um, patients appropriately. And then in the end, they'll go and review a little bit of the, uh, of the new um, guidelines for CT scanning to evaluate prosthetic valves, which the TAVR team has adopted recently. So selecting patients for CTA. So as Steve said, I'll briefly touch on this again, is um, you'll get a much better image if the patient's heart rate is both regular. If they're in AFib or rapid, you're gonna have a much lower quality image if their heart rate is regular and it can be slowed down. The reason for that we'll touch on in a second and Steve already mentioned it a little bit. Um, BMI above 40, the, the more obese someone is, the lar if someone has large breasts or is obese, um, you have to, the, there's much more attenuation of the x-ray beams as the cath lab uh, interventionist will tell you when you have an obese patient on the table, they have to turn the x-ray intensity way, way up to try to see anything. And the same is true for CTA. So if someone has a BMI over 40, there's a much more likely chance that the image is blurred, that the resolution is poor. And obviously that means a more, uh, more higher chance that you're going to get a non-diagnostic study. Normal renal function. In general, if someone's creatinine is less than 1.5, we're not too worried, but we do have to give them contrast. So you guys know, just food for thought, the volume of iodinated contrast we give uh, with each scan is 88 cc. So it's a large contrast dose. It's much higher than they use in the cath lab for a diagnostic angiogram. 88 cc's of contrast with hydration protocol that we have set up if they have um, abnormal renal function. The other thing, if you want to get a good CT image, is the enemy of all imaging is motion. If you and, and coronary arteries are very small. They're a few millimeters. So even the slightest amount of motion can blur the coronary arteries when you're trying to look at an object that's only three millimeters, as is the, you know, the mid and distal portion of your coronary arteries. Even this tiniest amount of motion can blur the image. So a patient should, if you want to get a good CT image, is a patient should be able, they have to lay flat on their back and they have to hold still. 
They also have to be able to hold their breath for a few seconds and follow breathing instructions. Obviously, the diaphragmatic excursion, if they breathe at the time the image is acquired, the image is almost worthless most of the time. Um, they also have to be able to lie on the CAT scanner table with both arms above their shoulders in order to get the arms out of the way of the scanner. We have imaged a few people with an arm down, but the problem is that's extra attenuation. That's bone, muscle, skin that the, the x-ray has to scan through to get the lateral borders of the heart. So that's something you have to consider when ordering these is are there orthopedic limitations? Can the patient lay flat on the CAT scanner? Can they lay still? Can they hold their breath? And can they follow those instructions? If not, these things, you're dead in the water right away and you get a very poor quality scan. The other, the other thing that we have to give them prior to the procedure to lower their heart rate is beta blockers. Even if people, you think that they're, they have a resting heart rate of 60 or 70, a lot of times when that contrast goes in, it causes a reflex tachycardia. People have to do breathing exercises. They get anxious. Their heart rate goes up. So we give almost everyone beta blockers before this. So keep that in mind when you're selecting patients if they're uh, intolerant to beta blockers um, and their heart rates are above 70, they may not be good candidates. The other thing that's very important, and there's been trials showing this, which I, which I won't go over, but I'll mention, is that we give 0 0.8, so we give two 0 0.4 milligrams of, uh, of sublingual nitroglycerin. And the studies have shown that you give less than that or none, that you really, really decrease the specificity of the examination. So if your patient has that very low blood pressure and doesn't tolerate nitrates or has a history of hypotension to nitrates, that's also a reason not to send them for a CTA. So um, that's just kind of an overview of how we perform the scan and barriers to getting a good quality images. The, as Steve said, I'll briefly touch on this. The, the best time to image the heart is diastasis, which is mid diastole. There's the least amount of cardiac motion in that. And as Steve already said, um, as you increase heart rate, systole stays about the same, diastole shortens and heart rates above about 70 diastasis almost completely goes away. So if the heart rate's above 70 or so, we end up many of the times having to image in systole. There's more motion in systole. You frequently get motion artifact in the right coronary artery distribution and it degrades the quality of the image. This is an old thing, but the absolute and relative contraindications things to think about hypersensitivity to... Oops, sorry hypersensitivity to contrast dye, um, you know, inability to tolerate the beta blockers, the nitrates, renal insufficiency, uh, history of hyperthyroidism, someone who's not going to do well with a large bolus of iodine because it could cause thyroid dyscrasias, things like that. Uh, AFib uh, and inability to hold their breaths. So with appropriate use criteria, the, the Society of Cardiovascular CTA has set out appropriate use criteria for use of their examination. Uh, these are important to know because A, they're going to affect payor ability. So um, for the most part, when I order a CTA, I find that almost all of the denials are related to the fact that the scan that I ordered wasn't, wasn't uh, appropriate. Um, and so it's important to understand these criteria. And, and they're also good to know because they increase the chance that you're, you're ordering a test for a patient that's appropriate, that's gonna give you a good result. Um, so the ex, as, as Steve already said, several expert consensus panels, including the European Society of Cardiology, have now endorsed the use of CTA for excluding coronary artery disease. The keywords here are in symptomatic patients. So basically there's very few appropriate use uh, criteria for CTA for patients who are asymptomatic. So if a patient comes into you and says, I wanna know if I have plaque in my arteries, I feel fine. There's a very good chance that you order that, that will get denied. Um, and the other thing that Steve touched on that I wanna reiterate that's sort of the crux of all of this is that CTA is its real power is in its negative predictive value, meaning it's very good at ruling out coronary artery disease or ruling out obstructive disease in people who are low or moderate risk. It, its positive predictive value is where its weakness is in that you have a fair amount of false positives with CTA. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. 
And so almost all of the appropriate use criteria are direct reflections of this, of the fact that CT is excellent uh, in its negative predicted value. And if you remember Bayesian statistics from, uh, from uh, studying statistics, you know that pretest probability has the greatest effect on what your outcome is. So CTA has the most power in patients who have low or a moderate pretest probability of coronary disease. And the main limitation of CT scan, other than movement artifact, as, as Steve touched on, is that coronary artery calcification alters the diagnostic performance of CT angiography. Um, coronary calcium substantially attenuates the X-ray images. It leads to blooming artifacts um, and obscures the coronary lumen, even if there's minimal narrowing on invasive angiography. And the same is true with any object that is metallic, so that the same goes uh, holds true for stents. And obviously, if the patient has a pacemaker in place, that obviously causes artifact too. So here's an example, and Steve showed this too, of calcium blooming artifacts. So you can see in this person's right coronary artery that there's extensive calcium from the osseum all the way to the mid portion of the vessel. When you see calcium, like when you see calcified lesions like this, you can also see that as a reader, it's very difficult, or you could argue impossible, to um, to accurately identify what percentage of the lumen is narrowed by this calcified plaque. As uh, the interventionalist will tell you, uh, if you ask them about this, a lot of these uh, CT scans get referred to them and angiographically, they look fine. There's, the plaque is just on the surface of the vessel, but by CT scan, it looks like that calcium almost completely obscures the lumen. And this here is the crux of CT's weakness. This is the really the limitation of CT scan and why, where it falls off. And, uh, and like, uh, as you'll see that all the appropriate use criteria are written around this fact that you get a, a lot of false positives if people have a high calcium score or if they have stents or anything in their arteries. Here's another example. This is a patient that we imaged yesterday. Um, this, person's, um, this person's LAD here, you can see the LAD comes off and this is the anterior wall of the heart. You can see that in the proximal portion of the LAD, there's this very bright plaque, incredibly dense, incredibly blooming artifact. In the short axis image of it, you can see that the calcification appears to almost completely obscure the lumen. So this person, um, it'd be very difficult to, to exonerate the LAD and say that there is or isn't stenosis as a result of that. You can see that the distal vessel has disease but fills well with contrast. So these are just a few examples of calcium blooming artifact and the difficulties that that presents in getting accurate interpretation of the visual degree of stenosis. Here's another one that we did, uh, same thing. Uh, this person ended up having the, the by cor invasive coronary angiogram had minimal uh, non-obstructive disease in the LAD. But when you look at this, it looks like these dense plaques completely obstruct the lumen. And when you try to look at the vessel in short axis, basically the entire lumen is filled with calcium blooming. So as a result of that, and Steve touched on this a little bit, I'll just reiterate. Um, we perform a calcium score prior to doing almost every coronary CTA. So part of our CTA protocol is they get a calcium score first, and then that data is also, as, as if you've ever ordered a CTA or looked at our reports, that data is then reported along with the coronary angiography. So um, our lab has set an arbitrary cutoff, just so you guys know, of 2,000, as if it's above 2,000, we absolutely won't scan it. So this is the first slide of, of, of um, this is clipped directly from the Society of Cardiovascular Commuted CT website of appropriate use criteria. This is their A stands for appropriate and U stands for uncertain. In the, in the upcoming slides, you'll see that the I stands for inappropriate. So this says, what is the diagnostic impact of pre-CT scanning coronary calcium scoring on our decision to perform a contrast CTA? And you can see, of course, that um, 
there's been no actual agreement in what is an actual cutoff to where a lab can does not perform it. As I said, we set an arbitrary cutoff of 2000. We really prefer the score to be under 1000. So if someone has a known calcium score of less than, a, or, I'm sorry, if someone has a pre-CT scan calcium score of less than 100 or 100 to 400, the society gave it uh, an A, that's an appropriate scan. If you do a pre-CT calcium score and the score comes back 400 to 1,000, that's uncertain. And obviously greater than 1,000 is also uncertain. So the, the guidelines have not come out and given an exact cutoff at which lab, they say labs, you should not perform this. And it's sort of a case by case basis. In terms of inappropriate criteria, uh, or in terms of the appropriate use criteria, the society has designated this as an inappropriate test. If someone had a positive, if someone had a positive calcium score more than two years ago, they deem this to be an inappropriate test. So, in other words, if you had a patient who comes in now with with chest pain or, or concerning symptoms, and you see that in 2016 they had a high calcium score, this would not be a good test. The reason for that is because we know from calcium scoring studies that despite any sort of lipid lowering therapy, PCSK9, statins, whatever it is, that your calcium score tends to progress very predictably in your percentile for aging gender, regardless of any interventions that you do. So you can almost guarantee if someone had a uh, elevated calcium score more than two years ago, that their calcium score is going to be even higher and you're, you're doing a test on someone who has a high pretest probability of having coronary disease. The other main uh, thing that is, is becoming a contentious point, and this may change in the upcoming years, but for now, what they recommend and what has, is going to probably affect payor reimbursements the most is risk assessment post revascularization. So the question is, when should you be ordering a coronary CT if someone has known coronary disease and has been revascularized either by cabbage or with PCI? Um, the, the issue with this is that um, the, the stent, uh, you know, evaluating patients with stents has not been validated in the CT data, and there's a very high risk of in uninterpretable studies in people who have stents. So, um, the point that I made earlier was that CTA is, is it's really its strength comes in evaluation of people who do not have known coronary disease with lower moderate pretest probability of coronary disease. Once they have known coronary diseases and they have stents, then it becomes much harder to evaluate um, for stenosis specifically within those stents. So in the first line, these are people, so this is the appropriate use criteria who are symptomatic post revascularization. And, this, and, the, and the society has given this a class 1A, a big thumbs up, the highest number, eight out of eight panelists or eight out of nine panelists thought this was appropriate. Uh, and that is if someone is symptomatic and they've had cabbage, CTA is fantastic for evaluation of graft patency after cabbage. So if you have someone who's had bypass surgery and they're having symptoms, CTA can be considered as a first line test to evaluate the bypass grafts. You know, the even more benefit is that the bypass grafts are, are secured in the chest, so they're less affected by motion artifact. They're usually very well visualized. So this is a very appropriate use of this test and I've seen a lot of people ordering that. So if anyone has had a stent in their coronaries and the stent is less than three millimeters in diameter, it, the CT has been uh, deemed inappropriate. And I'll show you some examples from our lab as to why, but essentially the blooming artifact from the stent makes it very difficult to evaluate the lumen within the stent. Prior coronary stent diameter greater than three millimeters if someone has comes complaining of angina and they had a, a large stent either in their LAD or in their proximal circumflex, this is this got a recommendation of uncertain. Part of that I think is because of the evolving technology and the increased spatial resolution is allowing us in large stents to evaluate the lumen of the artery within that stent much better. But no studies have shown that this is an accurate uh, way of doing it. So it has a um, as an appropriate use that has been deemed uncertain. 
I think this is one of the most common reasons that you're going to get your CTAs denied. If someone has known coronary disease and a history of PCI, um, it's going to be hard to get it approved, especially going forward as this becomes more and more mainstream. Um, and then the other thing is for asymptomatic patients prior coronary artery stenting. Uh, I think just a take home point here is if someone's had a prior stent, the only um, appropriate CT you could actually order that's gotten a, an A for appropriateness is if they've had a left main coronary stent and they're asymptomatic. So for routine monitoring of left main stents and people who you want to, their entire uh, coronary flow is dependent upon that left main stent because you know it's a large stent, it's proximal, less affected by motion artifact. And this has been validated with studies. So if you have a left main stent, it's a very good test to order to, to evaluate that. And obviously, anyone who's had a, a stent that's less than three millimeters is deemed inappropriate. And if you've had a stent that's greater than three millimeters and it was less than two years ago, it's also inappropriate. So this is uncertain if old stents that are large can be evaluated that aren't in the left main. The other thing here, if you look at uh, people who are Symptomatic, this, this is just a summary here. If you've had a, a small stent, if you've had small stents and it's less than two years after PCI, if you've had a large stent and it's less than two years after PCI, all these things are gonna be inappropriate and you'll probably get them uh, denied by the insurance company. So here's just an algorithm that they put out for people. Is someone post revascularization, have they had a, um, are they asymptomatic? Well, if they're asymptomatic, you can go right down the line. The only appropriate thing in an asymptomatic person is evaluating their prior large left main stent. Uh, if, they're, if they've had a stent or cabbage and they're symptomatic, if their stent is greater than three millimeters and you, in proximal, it's uncertain whether that's a good test. And if their stent is small or recent, it's inappropriate. And the only appropriate use on this side is for people who've had bypass surgery. So here's an example of that. So this was a, a study we did in December. This is a patient who had uh, circumflex stents that are sequential. You can see that the, um, the proximal stent there is a three millimeter stent um, that's in the proximal portion of a large circumflex. And you get the idea here that the, the stent is probably okay. The distal vessel feels, feels very well, but there's several sequential areas within this stent where the artifact obscures the lumen about 80 or 90%. And you can, you can say that this looks probably patent, but there's a good chance that you're missing something here and you really feel somewhat uncomfortable saying that this is, that you totally exonerate this. And this is, these are real life examples from our, from cases that we've done over the last few months. So this is a right coronary artery stent. Uh, this was also a three millimeter stent. I put this in here to illustrate another, um, Another pitfall that we encounter is in patients with pacemakers, and you have an RA and an RV lead, that the pacemaker artifact will bloom and very frequently obscure the right coronary artery. So this person has a stent there, and the pacemaker artifact blurs out the mid portion of the stent. So this makes this study non-diagnostic. You can say as a reader that the distal vessel fills very well with contrast. You don't see any obvious lesions, but there's a blurring due to the pacemaker artifact. So this is an example of, an, of what, an, uh, in terms of the appropriate use criteria that would be uncertain, but I think that in the future, in, in our um, in our CTA lab and with our patients, I think is probably very reasonable to do. And that's to evaluate symptomatic patients with prior stenting when the stents are large uh, and proximal. You can see here that this is a, this is a patient um, that was sent over this month who has a single vessel disease and he has a large stent uh, in his prox LAD in the setting of a of a acute coronary syndrome. And you can see here that the stent is very well visualized in a four millimeter stent. You can see the walls of the stent and you can see the entire lumen very well. So CT, our, our CAT scanner is really good at evaluating large proximal stents, not so good for any CAT scanner at evaluating smaller and distal stents. And, and I think that the more stents that someone has, the more likely it's going to be that you get an ambiguous uh, result from the study. So this is the sweet spot of this, of this is detection. This is the really where the, the power of coronary CT comes in and where the future is. 
and what New West was really um, focusing on was getting a CTA first protocol for patients without known coronary disease who are low or moderate risk who present with symptoms that may be an ischemic equivalent. This is really where the test is, is, is very powerful. And as Steve said, it has additional predictive value on top of a nuclear or a treadmill stress test. And you saw in the Scott trial that people had better outcomes when they got a CT over a stress test. And that's because you get additional information. When you do a perfusion study or a treadmill stress test, the patient is given a yes or no answer. And they're, and they're sent away with that. Yes, you have a blockage, you, you need revascularization or no, you do not have a blockage. What is the no telling you with a new stress test? It's telling you, you don't have probably based on data, you probably don't have an 80% or greater blockage. But you know when you do a CTA, if the patient has diffuse atherosclerosis, do they have soft plaque, as Steve showed in the LAD? Do they have a 50% blockage in three arteries? That's going to fundamentally change the way you, you treat someone. So I think that's the kind of the take-home point of appropriate use is low and intermediate risk patients with ischemic equivalents is the best and where we can start to see a, a CTA first strategy going forward will be used. Um, this article illustrates that, and this is one of the most important articles, is uh, uh, this study was showing CT angiography for the prediction of hemodynamically significant stenosis in intermediate and severe lesions. This is similar to the data from the cath lab that shows that while visually looking at something like a coronary invasive angiogram or a CT coronary angiogram, once the lesion becomes intermediate or severe, we're actually very bad at predicting whether that lesion is stenotic. And that's why in the cath lab, when tr you know trials even on invasive angiography showed similar things that the sensitivity and specificity of the cardiologist eyeballs at looking at a stenosis and saying, oh, that's definitely significance is not that great. And that's why in the cath lab over the last decade, invasive flow uh, hyperemic flow has been become the standard of care. And that is why CT angiography has poor specificity is because we're very bad at looking at a lesion and saying whether we think it's significant or not. So single take home point from that trial was that on a per patient basis, the specificity and positive predictive value of a stenosis, if, if, if a cardiologist said this stenosis is greater than 70%, uh, to predict a, uh, an FFR of less than eight was 60 and 55%, almost a, a little bit better than a coin flip. And this really highlights the point that the CTA has excellent negative predictive value. So it's good at saying you definitely don't have any lesions over 50%, but it's not great in positive predictive value. And that is why um, the heart flow came out. So this is a patient that uh, we did last month that illustrates that point. You see that there's this, this shelf of plaque here in the LAD. In the proximal portion of the LAD, this, this uh, eccentric calcified plaque appears to really almost completely narrow the lumen proximally when you see this curved uh, reformation. Here's the same image in the, in the linear uh, reformation where you see that the LAD plaque there obscures much of the lumen. And in the short axis, the plaque at, at this point here with the highest degree of stenosis almost appears to completely um, to completely obstruct the lumen. So this is, I, I use this as an example because I think this is one of the studies where prior to FFRCT, the cardiologist would have said, this person needs to have a, a cath because I think they have a significant stenosis in their LAD. Uh, but this was sent for FFR and the FFR showed that the uh, LAD flow was completely normal. There's this little tiny uh, red part in the, in the diag that was not sig clinically significant. So does that, I, I wanna take any quick questions before I move into the uh, review of the new application of what we're doing for prosthetic valve thrombosis. Yeah, there were a few questions from Dr. Sundrum. Yeah. Um, um, Randy, go ahead. So the, the, yeah, he's got three questions here. We'll do the first two first. Um, what's an average number of minutes it takes to complete CTA and how long is the patient in the scanner? 
So the the um the the scan itself is very quick. So it's it, the the scan takes as much time as it takes to they they have an IV started when they're out in the waiting area. They sit there in the little chair outside the CAT scanner that you'll you'll probably see patients sitting there sometime with an IV in their arm reading a magazine. When their time has come, they're walked into the scanner and they're placed on the table. They lay backwards and they're advanced into the CAT scanner. They, they go under the CAT scanner for about a minute while the techs do scout images and line up the, the um, scanner with the area of their heart. Then the patients are instructed to take a deep breath. They're, they're given a few seconds of breathing instructions and then the scan is acquired in a single heartbeat. So they're probably on that scanner table for just a couple minutes in the time it takes to set them on the table, put them into the scanner, acquire the scout images and line up the scanner with their heart. And then Liz walks in there and gives them sublingual nitroglycerin. And then the scanner is performed in a single heartbeat. Um, and then uh, last question is, uh, so, are so it's different. It's different than if you can remember our old nuclear camera before we got the new one, the patient had to lay flat there for the entire acquisition of the, of the nuclear study. A cardiac MRI, they have to lay flat and go in the magnet for 45 minutes. So this is less than five minutes. Thank you. Uh, the last one is, are radiologists involved in reading CTA in office or in hospital? And then I have another question after that one. So at South Denver Cardiology, our techs acquire the scans there. Uh, Steve and I read all of the scans and the coronary things. And then the radiologists are contracted out to read the extra cardiac findings. So they look through the small amount of lung, uh, mediastinum, rib, excuse me, esophagus, et cetera, that is incidentally acquired with the scan. The radiologists, we contract them out to read those extra cardiac findings. And that's purely to reduce our liability, obviously. Do um, other, the other radiology, yeah, at, at, at other centers, radiologists exclusively read coronary CTAs. It just depends. I know that the radiology group at Littleton, the big group that we work with, is starting their own coronary CT program and they're getting FFR and stuff. They've talked to me about that. So, yes, radiologists at some places read these. If you ordered one of these at Swedish, they can do them. It'll be read by a radiologist. They can do them at Porter as well, and they'll be read by a radiologist. Uh, when are beta blockers given? So beta blockers are given, the patients are sent home with instructions to take beta blockers the night before and the morning of the procedure. So they get a dose of beta blocker the night before, uh, unless their heart rate is below 60. They get a dose of beta blocker that when they leave their house, unless their heart rate's below 60. And then when they arrive, uh, the CT techs take their pulse and this decision is made to administer additional uh, anti-chronotropes uh, prior to putting them on the scanner. So if they took uh, 50 of metropol the night before and they took it on their way into the scan when they arrive, if their heart rate is high, Liz and Michelle will give them either Corlin or, or more beta blockers to get their heart rate down. A couple more questions here. Can you do FFR post CTA? Uh, that's that's the only time you do it. So the CTA is required and we acquired and then we look at the images and decide if we think FFR is appropriate. I, I guess I'm not understanding that question entirely. Uh, let's let's try this one. Uh, is there any information on microvascular disease with CTA? Uh, there is. There's there's um, there's definitely studies out there that are reserved for the academic institutions. Um, specifically, what you're talking about is coronary coronary flow reserve measurements by CTA, and that's all that's all in the stratosphere. At, you know, at Hopkins, they're doing things like that. Um, we're at, at Yale, they're doing coronary flow reserve using um, PET PET scanners and things like that. Uh, but you you know, remember the limitation of CT is its, is its spatial resolution. So objects that are much smaller than three millimeters, you can't see, they become blurred. So you can't really see small vessels very well by CT. Um, even sometimes there's a challenge to read the distal, to, to even visualize at all the distal portion of some of the arteries, especially in, in smaller, you know, you get little old ladies who have small arteries even proximally. 
Thank you, Grant. That's all the questions we have for right now. We'll let you continue and uh, catch up later. So, and, and I'm not sure if the question was asking, but can you do um, FFR post stenting? And the answer is no. If someone's had a stent, they cannot get FFR. It invalidates the algorithm. Okay, a quick review of um, of uh, new applications because I know we're running out of time. So uh, this is a, a new thing that the TAVR program is using. There was an autopsy trial that came out that showed that a very high percentage of people following implantation of their TAVR valve or really any prosthetic valve, it doesn't matter that if it's a TAVR or a surgically implanted valve, get subclinical leaflet thrombosis. I think in all of us who take care of these patients, since our TAVR program is so robust and we're doing more than 100 a year, all of us are taking care of a lot of post-TAVR patients or send our patients for TAVR. And you're seeing that occasionally you'll, you'll see that the uh, hospital discharge day echocardiogram shows a normal velocity through the TAVR valve and then they'll come up for their one month follow-up and the velocities across the valve will be significantly increased. Uh, you'll see this pretty commonly. And what we're finding is that these valves after implantation have subclinical leaflet thrombosis. And so we discover, they discovered that by looking at, um, the, the, by using the CT scanner, doing a full, retro, a full uh, retrospective gating of the cardiac cycle and then zooming in on that valve, we can see the valve leaflets very, very well and we can minimize the metal artifact from the struts of the TAVR valve uh, and visualize that valve even better than a transesophageal echocardiogram can. Um, So uh, prosthetic valve thrombosis, it was more common in these, in these uh, patients in the study who had low flow states, so people who have that low stroke volume or low stroke volume index. It was more common in people where the, uh, where the transcatheter device was implanted low, meaning more towards the ventricular side than the uh, aortic outflow side. And this is what we're looking at on CT scan is the degree of, of RELM, which is reduced leaflet motion. And so what we do on the CAT scanner is we zoom in on the valve and you can play it live and watch the valve open and close. And you can see, you can, this is, uh, the, this is um, illustrative, it's, it's, it's stylistic because you can't actually see the thrombus on the valve like this. And I'll show some real images. Um, that I clipped, but you can see that one of the leaflets in systole will have significantly reduced leaflet motion. So it'll look like this, you know, it'll look um, semi-lunar rather than perfectly open. So this is one of the trials where they did where they randomly took 100 people and put their valves under CAT scanner and look at them. And you'll see that several of these people had this reduced leaflet motion where this uh, hypo attenuation of one of the leaflets to some degree. And this is looking at it in short axis where you're looking at the valve and the Mercedes Benz sign. And then these are looking at it in long axis. So this is what I can visualize on CT scan when I look at these. Notice this here is um, thickened, darker from the base to the mid portion. And then, then it sort of is normal at the valve coaptation point. These are all different examples of subclinical leaflet thrombosis. And you see them both in short and long axis views. Attenuated leaf leaflet motion um, has been associated with earlier valve failure signal for a slight increased risk of, um, of strokes in the, in the months preceding TAVR. Um, and it's also been shown in, in studies that therapeutic anticoagulation can reverse both the hypo attenuated leaflet motion uh, and restore normal leaflet motion. So if you see your patients who are getting 4D, we call it a 4D CTA of the valve, and then they're coming back on blood thinners, this is why. And if, we've only done a handful of these and almost all of them have had um, hypo attenuated leaflet motion with evidence of subclinical thrombosis on the valve, and which kind of illustrates what they showed in that autopsy study, how common this is. So in this study, they showed that prior to um, uh, starting anticoagulation, these people had uh, in hypoattenuation lesions on their uh, valve leaflets and following, uh, if you just gave them DAPT, it didn't do a whole lot for the um, thrombus, but if you gave them warfarin, rivaroxaban, or Eliquis, that almost all of these patients notice these big uh, hypoattenuated lesions on the leaflets, they almost all resolved in all of these patients if you gave them therapeutic anticoagulation. 
So you'll be seeing more and more often people following Tavar, uh, going on Warfarin or Eliquis for a few weeks or months uh, if their valve velocities go up. That's uh, all I wanted to say about that because it looks like we're right at, at eight o'clock. All right, uh, thank you very much. We have a, a couple more questions here. Um, what is the wait time to get a CTA from the time I order to the time the test is completed? Um, I don't know, that's a good question for scheduling. I don't think it's too long. I mean, we do up to 10 or 12 of them a day. Okay. Uh, let's I don't move know. on. Uh, Brenda, Brenda may know that more or Steve, but you could ask uh, Liz. Um, is, uh, is, is this low attenuation on leaflets correla uh, correlated at all with gradients? Can CT estimate the gradient? So no, the gradients are, are done by echocardiogram, but the, it, it's usually the other way around. It's that someone has a post um, TAVR echocardiogram and their, and their gradient went up from seven to 15 or 10 to 20. Um, and so the, an elevated gradient across that valve prompts us to do these 4D CTs to look at that valve and then assess for the presence of subclinical thrombosis. Uh, Brenda answers here that it looks like uh, to get the test done, it's less than two weeks. A um, couple more questions here. So Eliquis and aspirin, and how long for anticoagulation? I'm not sure that they gave a specific protocol, but I think they usually do 90 days or so if the patient can tolerate it. Very good. Uh, let me just check and see if there's any more outstanding questions. And I think that is it. Hannah, I'm gonna, uh, let's see. Yep, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Hannah. Okay, um, our uh, Dr. Levine just asked, if your velocity goes up on echo, why do CAT just add anticoagulant? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's a good question. I think the reason for that is, is um, that a lot of these TAVR patients are incredibly frail, and a lot of them have history of bleeding or high bleeding risk, high has blood scores. And there's a lot of reasons why your velocity goes up. Uh, you know, obviously, transvalvular gradients are dynamic and can, can vary based on your afterload, your preload, your blood pressure, your volume status. And, and not all of these people have leaflet thrombosis. I think you want to confirm that you're treating uh, leaflet thrombosis before you put a 90-year-old on warfarin or something like that. So it's a good test to say, look, at, we have an objective evidence that you've got thrombus on your valve that may be uh, subclinical. We may have not been able to see it on echo, but on CT scan, you can see that thickening of the leaflet. And then they prove that with giving you Eliquis, that that will go away and your valve will still function normally. But it's, it's sometimes not just a easy decision to put some of these elderly TAVR patients on therapeutic anticoagulation along with aspirin concomitantly, you know? Okay, very good. Um, I just wanna thank Dr. Friedrich and Dr. Bailey for um, their incredible talk and for taking the time to talk to all of us. And um, thank you all for attending our first Sunrise Seminar of 2021. Uh, don't forget that at the end of the meeting, you'll be prompted to fill out um, a objectives survey, and that will give us the information that we need in order to get you your certificate. Uh, we are hoping to do these Sunrise Seminars at a more bi-monthly schedule, um, so please keep an eye on your schedules and your email for all of that. At this point, we will conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day. Thank you again, Dr. Thanks, everyone. And Dr. Bailey.